character is that. The Larry Dunn Orchestra proudly presents the anthology of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Get away Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Martin, broadcasting from Casio. Today we have another really exciting artist spotlight, uh, very exciting guest coming up. But first, I want to introduce my co-host to joining me live from 820 miles to my east, Mr. Richard Formadoni. How are you doing today, Rich? Doing pretty good today. Thank you guys again for joining us. This is going to be a fun one. Awesome. Well, we have an amazing guest. His keyboard playing helped transform Earth, Wind, and Fire into one of the most successful R&B bands in the world, with sales of over 100 million albums worldwide, seven Grammy Awards, four American Music Awards, 32 gold and multi-platinum records, a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame, an introduction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a Songwriters Hall of Fame Award, a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and recently a Kennedy Center Honor he has countless solo records and collaborations, and he's also the founder of the Larry Dunn Orchestra. Welcome to the broadcast, Mr. Larry Dunn. Hey, Welcome, guys. Larry. Hey, Good to see you. Good to see you. Can't hug you, <laughs> but we can see you. <laughs> Larry, what can be said about you that hasn't already been said about Mozart and Beethoven and Einstein, the guy who invented Ziploc bags? You're an innovator, and you're responsible for so much incredible music that has affected generation after generation of musicians. So it's so great having you here today. My, Thank you for joining my, us. My pleasure, as always. So as always, I also want to rec uh, just let everybody know we're watching the chat on Facebook and YouTube live, so you have the opportunity to ask Larry questions yourself. And please also give us thumbs up, shares, likes, all, and subscribe to our channel. We'd greatly appreciate it. So... Um, with that being said, Larry, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how did you get started in music? Oh, God. Well, my father was a musician. He played uh, upright bass, guitar, and piano. And you've heard the story of Tree and Times. We had a raggedy upright piano. I used to beat on that. And uh, it just from then on, it just it never left. I got a guitar in fourth grade, and I played that, played the Beatles and Ray Charles and I uh, wanted to be in the band, so in fifth grade, uh, they had uh, loner instruments, and the only I would, the day they gave them out, I was out sick with a sore throat. So when I went back the next day, the only thing they had was a baritone horn. I'm like, hey, I'll take it, and uh, that served me very well. Uh, then later on, uh, the next year, sixth grade, they bought me a, a Kimball organ. That was it. I used, to, I used to sit in the living room and mimic and uh, slow records down half speed and learn Jimmy Smith and and then started playing nightclubs. Hilliard Wilson and I uh, grew up together in Denver. Before we met Philip Bailey, we had our own band. I was 11 and he was 13. And uh, we were playing nightclubs and stuff, 13 and 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, my mom, God bless her, out seven nights a week in a 21 and over nightclub. And we played everything. So that's where you really, well, that's where I really so, honed the skills. So that, I mean, Larry, how 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 did your mom deal with that, being so young and, and playing in, in nightclubs at that age? That's just wild to think of. Well, apparently she had some insight. And uh, like I said, I think she felt sorry for me because Pops had split when I was about 13. And plus, um, she knew I was serious about the music, and she knew that was my heart. And like she said, she told somebody, she said, we never had to make Larry practice. We had to make him go to bed. <laughs> That's great. That's great. La Larry, you said you, you, you played the baritone horn. That's not a baritone sax, right? No. Totally no, different no. instrument. You, uh, a A.K.A. euphonium. You know, it's like, a, it's like a smaller tuba. 
and it basically plays beautiful secondary m melodies. You know, I remember one of my favorite tunes in uh, in band was Laura. Look it up. Very a really beautiful classical pop tune from uh, I guess the 60s. I don't know, 50s, 60s. And uh, you play that, that secondary movement, and uh, that just served me so well in going into the future and arranging and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, that must have given you a nice foundation for doing some for doing some horn arrangements later on. Absolutely, horn strings, whatever, because it's you know it's it kind of counter melodies, but so beautiful, you know. So, so back when you started playing, what kind of instruments were you lugging into the nightclubs? Um, the little Kimball organ, <laughs> and uh, but hey, it was great. And uh, then when we started playing that Twenty One and Over nightclub seven nights a week, they had a B three organ. Oh, that was it. I was just beside myself. Mm. Complete orchestra all at once. Absolutely. So, so uh, can you tell us how you first met Maurice and Verdine? Uh, yeah, it was at that, you know, at that club. We actually had a group then with Philip and Hilliard, Steve Sykes, Larry Thompson, Carl Carwell, a bunch of guys. And uh, we knew about their music, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire with the first two albums with the older people from Chicago. Uh, they had two albums on Warner Brothers. So we were familiar with their music. And uh, so Perry Jones, who, you know, kind of discovered us and, and Prince, he worked for Warner Brothers Records, and he would come back and forth to, uh, to L.A. And uh, so we ended up opening the show for the older Earth, Wind & Fire, and it was in the afternoon. And then later on that evening, Verdine and Maurice came down to the club and, and checked us out. But we actually met him before we played that day at uh, in Denver. Wow, it's incredible. Um, I wanted to ask you: in in 2016, you gave a beautiful acceptance speech for uh, for your Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and you brought some special attention to the Phoenix Horns, who absolutely deserved it. Can you tell us a little bit about your process for arranging music for them? Well, you know, the thing is. I tell people, if Earth, Wind and Fire was eight on the Richter scale in 74, when these guys came in, it went to 18. Because not mm -hmm. only were they amazing players, but, uh, you know, Michael Harris, Romney, Michael Davis, Don Myrick, he plays so beautiful, don't you agree? Mm -hmm. And, Lu and yeah. Lewis and Lewis Satterford, actually, they both had birthdays uh, a couple of days ago. You know, they passed away quite quite. A quite a bit ago, but uh, man, they brought a whole vibration. And ma as a matter of fact, I was talking to Louisa about Sat on his birthday a couple days ago. And he used to always sign his autograph. He would draw a little man looking over a fence and he would always sign under their vibrations. So he was mm -hmm. way, way ahead of his time. And uh, like I said, when they came in, they brought not only just the fire, you know, they, uh, their vibration was just so awesome. Wonderful people. Mm. You know, when a lot of people think back to, to some of the best Earth, Wind, and Fire albums, uh, All in All certainly comes to mind. Yeah, and, uh, yo. yeah. <laughs> and that's, you, you had, had so much influence there. Can you tell us a little bit about being the musical director for that album? Well, you know, I was just musical director in, in general. like In the, the band, yeah. Especially for the live shows and, you know, putting stuff together. Uh, on, on the record, because on that one, yeah, I, that was the first album we had, we had to do without Step, Charles Stepney, mm. who, who was just another one of my mentors, just amazing, amazing producer and keyboard player and writer and composer and arranger. Uh, so it, it was like a lot of work. And I remember we recorded most of it. I mean, the demos at my little eight track studio when I was living in Culver City. And I had a little $150 drum set that I got from a pawn shop. And I was just beside myself. Freddie White and Maurice White were going to be playing my my little cheap drum set. <laughs> wow. And uh, so I was re recording. I had the, the Tascam, 
uh, not the just the square one, the one that kind of like this, like they had to transport up like that. Mm-hmm. And you could record, record seven and a half speed or 15 IPS. And so I would, a lot of times I would do seven and a half because I was wanted to save money on the tape. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Makes no. sense. Tape is not cheap. Oh, no. But uh, it, was, it was a great time, man. We would meet over there in my house every day. And I remember like a magic mind. Freddie was just playing his groove. And then I came with it. And then all that, I don't even remember. So actually, a lot of the, the, the great horn parts were actually arranged by Charles Stepney and then um, Tom Tom 84. Uh, was a great arranger, you know. I think he did stuff like Serpentine Fire. And, uh, and then, you know, later on, uh, Jerry Hay did some of the arrangements. So we've always surrounded ourselves with just amazingly talented people outside of the the, the nine. Mm, that's great. So, Larry, I was going to ask, you know, you're obviously one of the most pl- prolific members of Earth, Wind & Fire, but, but the Larry Dunn Orchestra has been around for over 30 years. I mean, how, how has that changed uh, you as a musician? How's that journey um, progressed for you? Into into the journey. <laughs> I um, know. Do you well, like what I did it, there, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. You could be saying that four times. Um, it was, it's been awesome because, you know, I, uh, I first met my wife, Louisa. Well, I met her even before, but we got together in 83. And uh, she used to work in the industry, like behind the scenes. And she worked at Columbia Square. Uh, the big thing for uh, CBS television up in uh, up Melrose, and then but I heard her singing in the shower one day. I'm like, hey, and so I remember I was selling my house uh, that I used to live in on, on Sunset, and we were in an apartment, and Yamaha said like forty thousand dollars worth of equipment, so much stuff that the uh, owner of the apartment building was scared that we we're going to break his elevator and earth when a fire was kind of going through transitions at that point and so we just set up the equipment and we started writing music right away and then eventually we started it was a, such a great thing started doing music for japanese television commercials and that was a that was a lot a lot of fun uh, you'll, you'll hear about that in the book <laughs> but that was awesome because you know we were able to do all types of music from satchmo kind of stuff to tom Waits to jazz funk to even opera with luisa and beppe cantorelli and uh, you know because being a member of earth Wind, and fire people assume sometimes well you know so he does r&b pop and maybe it's jazz but hey i took three years of classical and so if it was music we would do it and they knew that and a lot of times it was a competition and we get that call you guys won and we do it. And they say, maybe, can you change this? We change it, send it over the internet. And they wire the money. And a good time was had by most. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well, uh, for some reason, you and you and Louisa seem to have discovered the fountain of youth. So we need you to share whatever whatever source that is. Um, I'm glad you found a way to, to make music with the one you love. That's a wonderful thing. It really uh, is. It's beautiful to see, and and Louise is wonderful. Please say hi for us. Oh, absolutely. Um, question coming in: uh, What was it like to work with Ali Willis from Ruth Ann Greenberg? Oh man, they had to go there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that still that still hurts, but <clears throat> but on on a good note, she was an amazing human being, and uh, like we say, she was a writing mother figure. Mm. And uh, I mean, because people, they, some people know her <clears throat> for September. This is her, Al McKay, and Maurice. And then, but she also did a lot of other stuff in the Stone, different stuff. But she also did Neutron Dance for the Pointer Sisters. She wow. wrote the, the Color Purple. Um, uh, 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 Brenda Russell, uh, just she was, uh, extremely prolific and talented. And a very caring and kind person. So, like we always say, she will be sorely missed, but never forgotten. She just what a, what a talent. Mm. 
Awesome. So, Larry, um, your latest album, End to the Journey, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how that album came about? Uh, that was only my second solo album. We did the first one in 92. Uh, we went to uh, Japan and with our buddy Hiroto Kobayashi, and he knew a young kid that had a record company, a young man, and I remember, remember the cassette? So we played a cassette that had four songs on it, and we're like, bam, we had a deal. And the guy had one request. He said, can you just make sure you feature your wife? And we saw in one song, I said, oh, that's the easy part. Hey, honey, you want to be a... <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, over the years, you know, uh, she really came heavy with the production chops as well. So on the second one, the Into the Journey, and she's good at it. She always comes up with the name as well. First one was Lover Silhouette. The, uh, the latest one was Into the Journey. And she named that because that's exactly what it was. We were, I told people we were so blessed to work with so many great musicians. Paulinho da Costa, uh, percussion, one of the greats of all time. Manyango, uh percussion with Stevie. Ronnie Laws, Hubert Laws, James Ingram, B. Lloyd Taylor, um, Stanley Clark, mm. Foley from Miles Day. I mean, oh, yeah. I tell people, I said, man, Sheldon. we had enough. Sheldon Reynolds. I said we had enough people on there to make a Tarzan movie, and uh, <laughs> but it's I a who's who for sure. I, but you know, I remember we did a uh, you know had a movie out called "It's All About Love," uh, the Larry Dunn part of the Larry Dunn story because we got some more stuff coming. And Hubert Laws, I mean, he made me so happy when he, they were interviewing him. He said, "Well, you know, I've been working with Larry for a long time and." I remember when he did so and so on the Lost Family album, and Larry, he's the one that made that happen. I'm like, am I dreaming? Is this the Hubert Laws? And he said, but you know, so whenever Larry calls, you answer because you know it's going to be great music. And I'm like, wow. Mm. I mean, I, I remember the first time I heard him on, uh, I was about 17 or 16, uh, listening to Quincy Jones Walking in Space. And then when I found out on that first album that Philip and I were on, when Maurice had to regroup, um, Perry Jones, who actually discovered Prince and Philip and I, and he said, uh, they, on, on, on saxophone, they got Hubert Law's kid brother. I was like, yeah. And then when I came out, Ronnie and I actually were roommates for a bit. And again, just, and then I worked on almost all of Ronnie's albums, Friends and Strangers, all that stuff, before there were sequencers. So, throughout the years, you've seen our whole industry from from the ground zero to the fifty thousand foot view. How important is it to you to be working with people that you know and trust? Well, hey man, you know, like I tell people, that there's I don't know if the correct vernacular is there's there's very few bands, but let me say it like this: there's very few bands that we hear about. And I think because a lot of things today are basically solo artists. Because when you when you examine it, it's like having a band is like a marriage times whatever. So in Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know, on the road, and there was 13 of us. And you know what kind of patience and love and understanding you have to have to deal with that. Because everybody has... Uh, their own ego mm. and uh i don't think i mean e e i i've always told people to me ego my wife calls it e <laughs> easing god out but, <laughs> but 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 i right but i would say that uh, ego should be like your gas pedal you use it to, to, for certain things but just like a gas pedal if you put the pedal to the metal you're going to run up in something, and it's not going to be good. So, uh, I digress. That's wise words. Yeah. Should we take a look at some uh, some comments coming in? A lot of yeah, questions. There's been a lot of questions. Um, there was one earlier from Krista asking, uh, "What's your favorite Earth, Wind, and Fire song, and why?" Oof. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, but you know what? I love that that question because I tell people. 
uh, my mom was so awesome because, and, and Mike, you know, you got you got kids and, and, and you guys, and it's like, let's say Rich and I are your two sons, and Mac, <laughs> okay, and Mac, and then somebody asks you, Mike, Mike, who's your favorite son? And you go, Mac. Then Rich and I feel like dog poo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good one, right? Yeah. So, because the thing, I, I, I say this, I have some that I lean toward a little bit, but everyone is like having a child, and they're all wonderful, because like I, we used to say back in the day, when we put together an album, and everything I've worked on, from Caldera to Stanley Turrentine to Brody Laws, there's no hamburger helper. Hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, so much care and thought and talent goes into each and every song, that they're all your favorites. It's like I, I very rarely get involved with social networking because a lot of it's just nonsense. But in the last two days, I see a, a couple of people that are coming off saying stuff like, "Who was who was the best singer?" Uh, I just saw that today, Marvin Gaye or Luther Vandross. And I said, "Why?" And then somebody had posted, but they they were reading him. The point I said, "Oh, you just want attention." He said, Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, so and so and so and so, we're not funk. Uh, James Brown, we're not funk. Somebody said, you need to be slapped. <laughs> but, I would agree but, with that sentiment. Right? But then, like I said, you know, and they do this a lot. Who was, I mean, really? Luther Vandross or Marvin Gaye? So I wrote something. And like I said, I very rarely get involved, but when I do, I'm going to say what I, what, what I'm, what I want to say. I said, you know, why why does this keep going on? I said, because to me, it's like back in the slave days, they throw two slaves in, into a makeshift ring or whatever, and it, they had to fight to the death. And whichever one lived, was he the hero? No, he just was the one that didn't die. And so I said, you know, I just look forward to when people just go, hey, and like I said, they were both gifted with unbelievable golden voices. Enough said. Yeah. Why does one have to win? Right. I mean, you know, again, it's like he's my favorite child. But my mother, like I said, she she was always, she's, I love all my children and, and I don't have the favorite. Now, people say, well, people's parents say that, but they don't mean it. I said, well, still, that's fine. Because once you say that, the other kids, hey, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you're not, they're not going to. And that really, it, it does mess up some kids. You know, um, John's always been my favorite. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> so, again, man, word, words are very powerful. Mm. Uh, another comment came up. Um, you mentioned Caldera. Uh, Larry, I've always loved Caldera. I'd love to hear more about producing that band. Any... Uh, any stories you could you could share? Well, that was awesome. That was uh, my buddy Paul Addis, who owned a, a music store called the Eighth Note years ago. I said I was 20 years old, and he took me to the Baked Potato to see this band called Caldera. And I was like, get the front door. And he <laughs> asked me, he said, would you like to produce some? I'm like, does a does a fish have lips? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, like yeah, and uh, that's when I met up with met Eddie Del Barrio, the keyboard player, and then Jorge Struns, uh, Dean. I can't even remember Dean Cortez, I think. Of Bay, and they had the, the percussionists from Ecuador, different places, and the music was just unbelievable. And uh, Jorge um, Del Barrio. Eddie's older brother uh, did the string arrangements, and man, we we just had a ball. And Chris Brunt—that's where I first met Chris Brunt because he mixed it, we mixed it. So that was actually produced by myself, Eddie Del Barrio, and, and Hardy Strunz, the guitar player. And we did it up at Indigo Ranch, and we man, we just—you know—what what can you say? It's like when I was producing Lenny White, so much fun up at Indigo. With Donald Blackman and Lenny and. Nick Morak on guitar. I mean, just amazing New York, crazy musicians. Hmm. And uh, we had, man, it's just been so blessed to be around that level of, of musicians. And uh, for some reason, they liked working with me. 
Oh, that's fantastic. So, Larry, there's also been a few uh, gear questions in the the chat about you know the rig that you're using live, which includes uh, the PX5, of course, XWP1s, MZX500, uh, and I'm actually going to throw a couple pictures up here on the screen while we're talking. But you know, uh, obviously, we're we're thrilled to have you playing Casio, and you know, we met at the booth years ago. Um, you know, what's What's it been like having Casio keyboards on stage? You know, uh, you, I think you came to the booth at NAMM a few years ago to, to meet, to see what Joe Sample was playing, I believe. That's how I think we initially met. Right. Uh, well, of course, uh, Jerry Kowarski was also there, who you've known for, for years as well. But... Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> um, hi, Jerry. Uh, yeah, man, because the thing is, like I told people, when, uh, you know, I'm 13, 14 years old, lifting a b3 organ and i weighed about oh, 140 pounds soaking wet and when you when you first go into the venue or to the club come on man let's get help done get the, get the get the organ in there great when it was over <laughs> there, there was like me and our guitarist and our guitarist he was he was buff but actually, yeah, a couple of times, just him and I carrying a B3, and I'm 13, 14, 15 years old. And I said, now, ain't that nothing? Now that I'm about almost 197 pounds and 6'2", they come out with this stuff, like uh, the PX5. That was the first one that I really got into. Uh, 25 pounds? Yep. 88 key, weighted keys. I'm like, really? <laughs> now you come out with it. <laughs> but, I mean, and you know, I, I, I actually, you know, well, you know, because Joe Sample, uh, the story goes, he was trying messing around with it, and it was 40 minutes or 45 minutes had passed, and his own manager said, wow, I've never seen Joe anchored down that long on a new product. <laughs> and so I said, okay, let me check it out. And then now you see a lot of guys are like, and I still have to tell them, Man, I'm serious? You playing Casio? I said it's not your father's Casio. That's all I can tell him. And, 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 uh, and this has to be Jerry commenting on Facebook over forty years together with Casio. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was there, with Jerry, with the little M. Was it the M10, Jerry? Jerry. MT something. Yeah. Hey, the M10. I think I, Jerry. Jerry would know. His memory still working good. Um, yeah, man, and then and then I remember the second year because I, you know, promoted that for you guys then, and then the next year I called Michael and I said, "Hey, man, you got a keyboard?" Because you know I'm I'm the Moog guy, and I said, "You know, something like a Moog where I can do solos." He said, "Yeah, yeah, of course. It's it's a, it's XWP one," and I said, "Okay, well I'll bring my lexicon that I always hook up with my Moog." For my delay and reverb, he said, "You don't need it." I said, "But you don't need you, but you don't." Need, but I'm. But I said, and so I said, "Okay." So I remember Louisa was sitting down in the front row. Of the people, you know, hadn't started yet. So we, I said, "Okay, man, let's put together the sound." And we got Larry Dunn's classic Moog sound. And I remember guys coming to the club. We played Catalina Bar and Grill. And like, man, how you make that thing sound like a Moog? I'm like, it's programming but uh mike was there and whipped that up in about 10 minutes i told him what we're going for in fact i in fact yeah. i have a picture and i'm putting it right on the screen right now of that exactly and there in the background there's jerry kavarsky in the back of that photo uh, so you're playing the <laughs> xwp1 and the px5 beneath and uh that was at the nam show a few years back so thank you that was that's a great memory we love that i'll be <laughs> nam i'll be <laughs> nam <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, we got a good question from uh, uh, from a friend of ours, Richard Hunley. Hey, Richard, uh, can you explain how the interlude for All About Love is done? Your Rhodes into intro sound on Evil was amazing, as an aside. But yeah, he's asking about the interlude of All About Love. <laughs> You know what? When I went on the Jimmy Fallon show a few years ago on my birthday, um, 
Questlove requested that we do that. And I told him, I said, you know what that is, right? He was like, dude, <laughs> he was like, don't insult me. We figured that out when we were like 16 years old. I said, okay. But all I'm going to say is that the chords were the, I think, the B section or whatever of the song called Celebrate. Celebrate, uh, uh, seasons change, they rearrange. Then why, why and I? So there was those chords, and they take the tape and turn it upside down and play, <laughs> it, and play it backward. That actually the, was the brainchild of Charles Stepney to do that. Wow, that's amazing. That's pretty great. Uh, somebody's asking what your what your favorite kind of B three sound is. Oh, well, they're saying, can you play your favorite B three patch? But do you have you have a go to setting for for uh, Hammond organ when you when you get on it? Um, actually, you know what? I use the XWP one uh, with the ventilator. With the ventilator pedal, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, but you know what? I still have my B three in the dining room, and when my buddies come to day, like, where's the B three? Because it's closed up, and mm -hmm. the has got stuff on it, so it's more like a shrine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll move the stuff and lift it up, and and then that's the that's the B three. So, mm. uh, but yeah, that that uh, the XW has some pretty pretty good, and you add that ventilator, and it's pretty pretty good. Yeah, it seals the deal. Yeah, and eleven pounds doesn't hurt at all. So right, eleven free. And wait a minute, I, I told Mike, I said we were doing a gig a couple of years out in Newport Beach somewhere for this. Uh, the Guardsmen uh, Society, and I couldn't find the chord. My guy was setting the stuff, but we couldn't find the AC chord for the XW. Now, I knew about the, the Casio, the, the PX, mm -hmm. and Mike, you know, I, I, I put the battery, Luis put the batteries in, but it keeps shutting off. And your batteries, so, are, your batteries are toast, unfortunately. <laughs> no, these no, these are brand new, but it, it keeps shutting off after about yeah. thirty minutes. Oh well, it'll automatically power off if you're not playing it. Right, but you said there is a setting where we can change that. Not with batteries. So all Casio, all all Casio keyboards. Casio is a very green company, so all Casio keyboards have an auto power off setting. So if you're not playing them for a period of time and they're connected to AC they'll shut off and you can override that which is obviously important for a live gig but that, yes, uh, that if, we need, we need, but we if you're if you're running on batteries you can't override that so if you're not playing it it will it will turn off okay actually that makes sense because it saves the batteries but uh but it was it was kicking my booty when we were doing live gigs and i used the mx 500 for the whole quarter and and everything set and i went up you know oh and it shut down so I had to show Bill Brown, our, our manager, yep. he, used to, he used to mix the sound for the Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, to go up before the gig and turn it back on. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, 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 but that's what AC, so uh, we'll figure yep. that out. Auto power then off, it, there's, a, there's a setting in there. So now, But but back to the, uh, what were we talking about, the XW, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about organ sounds, if you got a favorite type of B3 sound. But no, no we, you know, we said that the XW with the... Um, with the vent. With, with, with the, the vent, vent. yeah. But then yeah. we went. Then we went somewhere else. Where we oh, going? I forget where we went after that. <laughs> I mean, that, hey, that, that makes three of us. Uh, 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 um, I got somewhere uh, else we can go. No, it sounds good. It was oh. about about the gear and stuff like that that we're using. So anyway, go ahead. Uh, someone is asking. Uh, after the love is gone, is one of the most trans transcendent songs of my life. What are your recollections of that song? I guess maybe they're asking recollections of, of making it or producing it. Well, actually, you know, that was written because, you know, Maurice was very good. Uh, like I said, we had so many talented writers and, and, and then producers, whatever, within the, the nine, the classic nine. But then we'd always reach outside, you know, because I introduced Eddie Del Barrio from Caldera to Maurice. And mm -hmm. Maurice got together with him and they wrote Fantasy. And I, I believe Philip Redeem wrote the lyrics, but I know the, the music was uh, Maurice and Eddie Del Barrio. Uh, and, and then uh, Jerry Peters, 
Skip Scarborough with the. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's, it, yeah. So we would always reach out and get great songs from other writers as well to make sure that everything was rounded. We had a a, a great, like I said, no hamburger helper. Hmm. All right, another question from the audience. Chris is asking, love your last LDO album. Anything new for our ears in the works? Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. No. No, 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 actually, we're finally, after 30 years, working on Luis's first solo project. Uh, We got some other artists that we're working with. Uh, Actually, starting, because we had such a great time doing the uh, the commercials we are now finally getting to what we want to do as well and that's some movie stuff so you know we, we have like i said i don't want to i don't believe in jinxing but i just they don't need to really go there to because people say you know what i want to do and then so whatever happens <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, you know so, yeah, you want to you know, keep but, the expectations in line exactly but no always doing music always working on music we just got back from overseas and thank God we got back about a month before all of this nonsense started happening. But uh, it was wonderful. We, Our good friend Patrick Karen Filovic, who owns Alliance Records, uh, had us over there. So we went to London. And we actually did a video with our girlfriend who sang with us three years ago when we did Larry Dunn and Friends in uh, Macedonia, the Lake Ora Jazz Festival. And it was me, Louisa, my younger brother on drums. And all the rest of the people were musicians from around Europe. And there was a young lady, a Jude, Judith Nichols, who a great singer. She sang with us. So she just doing her solo album. And she was doing a video because she works at Abbey Road. And so we got off the plane and they took us straight to Abbey Road. And it was awesome, man. They, they got equipment thrown through the, the, the aisles and stuff. But everything in there is functional and uh, I was messing around with the piano that was on Penny Lane it's about a hundred years old wow. but but the, the keyboard and this is perfect it's in perfect working conditions condition and man they got so in uh, the they do all the major movies but uh, the guy took us around and showed us everything the only studio we couldn't get in that they got so, and they're gigantic but the biggest one we couldn't get in because it's booked every day with the orchestras doing the, the, the film scores. Oh, wow. So that was, and then from there we went to Holland and had some meetings and met up with some wonderful uh, string players. And then we went to Macedonia and, and we actually, I hate that. And we actually uh, <laughs> put real strict, we put real strings on one of Luis's new songs and it was awesome. We had five string players and we multi-tracked them. And wow. uh, it, it was great, man. So we're, oh, we're all, about wait to hear the, that. All, all about the music. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, comment, comment there from Facebook says, Luisa is gorgeous. And that's true. Right. Yeah, she, it's true. Hey, t- <laughs> I agree with every word. <laughs> <laughs> we give her, give her our best. We miss her. Yes, Absolutely. indeed. Well, you know, it's funny because people always say, like you guys earlier, and you, you know, you have beautiful wives. You said, you know, what's, what's the the trick or I said there's no trick I said first of all like my grandmother used to say and then you know put God first yeah you have to have God in the equation you know like you see and it's really sad uh kind of like not to do with music now but the divorce rate is skyrocketing uh children child abuse spousal abuse because now people realize I have to really be around these people (laughs) <laughs> you know you know so the joking aside that that's really making people look in the mirror because back in our day remember you, you sat your butt down with the family and prayed and they had dinner and you had to talk and but now the kids are over there you know we're there and your wife's at work and, and now everybody has to actually be together and so it's it's a trying you know it's gonna you check your character yeah, okay. it's a test for a lot of people for sure. Yeah, it really is. People oh, need to, they bet like me and Mike talk all the time and say, hey, people, if they didn't realize before, they better realize now. Best thing you can do is be humble and pray 
and stop all this name calling and finger pointing and judging. I said, all that's going to do is bring more negativity on planet Earth, and that's the last thing that we need right now. Mm. We're getting lots of hearts and thumbs up live on the broadcast. Yes. So. Can I get a? Can I get a man? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, hey uh, Mike, I, I, I sent you that thing with that, that brother from, I don't know, New Orleans, where it was. It was like a minister, and he would say, don't let the corona get on it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. That's really That's funny. Great. <laughs> That's great. Um, Larry, some people are asking, what, what are some of your best memories from touring uh, with Earth, Wind & Fire over the years? You have one that stands out? I got a lot of them, but I... I, I might leak one, but let me, let me think. Oh, actually, you know, I'm going I'm to say this one because this is actually in Maurice's book. We were in that beautiful venue in Germany, and I think it was 81. I think it was the, the last tour with the, the, the original, the classic nine. Al McKay had left already, and that's I brought Roland Bautista back, who was actually on the Last Days and Times album, which a lot of people didn't know. And so anyway, it got back to Maurice. The two of the guys were, were arguing, or uh, uh, just Judy always says it's a carfuffle over <laughs> uh, over a, 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 a I hate to say groupie, but whatever she a uh, fan. I don't know the woman. I don't even know who it was. But word got back to Maurice. So Maurice, you know, he's putting on his shirt, flexing his on the leader muscles. He said, "Hey, I heard that you know a couple of you cats." was uh tripping on on this on his chick and fighting over that uh, so my question is you know what the is that about what the heck is that he says so are we out here for the music or the women five four <laughs> three two one larry the women <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened Maurice even was laughing so much he turned red. Everybody was cracking, and we went out and had a great show. <laughs> uh, that's great. In in all your travels, do you have any favorite cities that you like to go to? Wow, they were all great. But I, I tell you, and this is really sad because what's going on. But New York, New York City, mm -hmm. New York City. Well, you know the East Coast in general. Because back in 71, uh, <laughs> 73 or something like that, when we first started traveling after we were rehearsed and whatever, in L.A., nobody knew really knew who we were. I know that Maurice and them with the first group had kind of a little quasi hit with I think about loving you, featuring Sherry Scott, an amazing singer, and she's still doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and we would play that. And so that was the main thing. And then after that, we did, I think the first big one was Head to the Sky. There was kind of on Last Days in Time, I think one that really started propelling was an instrumental joint called Power that featured Ronnie Laws. And I think that was written by Maurice and Roland Bautista. But anyway, L.A., nobody really knew where we were. So we, and people think that, you know, from the from the jump, you got limousines and food. No. We would fly from California to the East Coast. So we may start in D.C. and then make it with Philly and then New York. And so we, and there was nine of us then. That's before the horns came in. And we'd rent three station wagons. And we'd take turns driving. Uh... We didn't let Verdeen drive, and I, Philip Bailey's the one that put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> now Verdeen doesn't have to drive because he has a driver, God bless him. But uh, but he's still smacking that bass though. So anyway, so we uh, would do the college circuit, and then when we came back the next year, then we started doing the bigger venue. So anyway, we were doing the Spectrum in Philadelphia, which was kind of like Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, the forum out here in, in LA and we were opening the show it was Earth, Wind & Fire The Four Tops and then Gladys Knight was the, the headliner and that was great we got a chance to talk with them and they were talking about how things are progressing a little bit because black folks back then didn't even get to have a dressing room and 
I remember Miles Davis when they would play. You, they're going to go to the bar. What do you, you have to go outside and stand in the alley. So that was educational. We had a great time. But anyway, they shut the lights down. It was time. It said, Earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> and I came out, and like 20,000 people had these little green things that were glowing. They were spinning them. I was like Steve Martin in the jerk. These are my people. This is my our music. <laughs> and uh, people say, you must have been scared. I said, no. I've been doing music since I was two years old. But I was like, you know, people say, come on, let's do this. But then back, like I said, in L.A., everybody is a star. <laughs> but but seriously, but, but seriously, we noticed a big difference. And Maurice would even, we would play Philly, D.C., New York, you know, even uh, Virginia, these places. And we, we used to call it, we, we'd get to stretch. We could do our little solos and different stuff. Mm -hmm. like when we would get to L.A., you know, he would cut a lot of our solos out and say, we just got to play the hits. Gotcha. Uh, even though, like I said, the L.A. crowd was it was great, especially, you know, as, as time went on and we got bigger, they were great. But the East Coast, there's a different, it's different. Because mm. in the, on the East Coast, and I used to say this even when I was 18, 19, if you say you can play the organ or the organ, <laughs> either the guy in New York is, is mental or he could play, he'll play your butt off. You know, the janitor plays better than... You know, a lot of the famous. So that was, and the same thing in Europe. In Europe, we could really stretch and play because they would sit there and listen to you, and then, and then, and then, like the East Coast, and then they'd get up and party with you as well. So wow. there, there was a difference. So a couple quick questions before we wrap up. There's one other from the uh, from the live stream coming from Facebook. Uh, Ken is asking uh, for keyboard players that are just starting to play you know what song would you recommend that they listen to that that had a huge influence on you as a keyboard player i like that question wow well, i mean there's so much great stuff but like i said for for me and that was just me i grew up one of my main mentors that i got a chance to meet Luis and i met him years and years later but when i was 11 years old jimmy smith and I said, turn it down, half speed. Now, Foley had turned me to, on this thing about 15 years ago, amazing slow downer. I'm sure all the, all the kids know what that is. Yeah. Where it not only will slow it down, but it doesn't Mickey Mouse it if you go up or down, you know what I'm right. saying? And so that's a great thing. And, but then, you know, the thing is, there's so many great players. And unfortunately, a lot of them are, 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 are leaving. Uh, McCoy Tyner just passed mm. away. Uh Onaji, a lot of great players. But, you know, the, the thing is, now you have so much privy to, to stuff. I mean, YouTube, you can find everything. Unfortunately, there's a lot of junk, but there's a lot of good stuff. And people always say, well, you know, the, the, the kids today, they don't know anything and so on and so on. But there's always some kids that are amazing. Corey, mm -hmm. uh, this other young keyboard player, I forgot his name, it, uh, Michael Paula, there's so many, there's so much talent out there. But the thing is, and it doesn't matter old or young, because now because of the internet, people, I need a job. And what do they do? They start looking and see, let me see what pays the most. There's an episode of Sanford and Son when he had to find a job because his buddy ripped off Lamont and his his buddies. And so he's sitting there trying to employ uh, the lady to find employment. He said, I don't want nothing messy like brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I tell people, I say, look. First of all, find something that you would that you enjoy. Hopefully, something will put a smile on people's face. And a lot of this is posting a lot. And I've always said that. That now you see the real heroes are not the athletes or the famous musicians and none of that. It's the guys, the ladies that work at the grocery store. That are, some of them are getting sick. It's the doctors and the nurses. And again, I always tell the story about when New York City was brought to its knees by the garbage men. And you could hear people, oh, girl, uh, 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 Tony, yeah, he's a garbage man. Tee hee. Well, when they went on strike and people had clothespins on their nose, and then after they negotiated and they came back, guess what? They are needed and they're no longer. Uh, uh, garbage men, they're sanitation technicians. 
<laughs> and so, so, so the thing is, people, you got to understand, everybody's important. Everybody does something different, and we need each other. But as you, like I said, but know your craft, whatever it is you want to do. And because um, back, like I said, back in our day, there was one prereq. You had to be able to play. They didn't care if you were cute or ugly, small or tall or, or black or white or Asian or Hispanic. You just, you had to play. Right. And, and, so, and so now people, it's not about the outfit. I mean, that's all well and fine. But the main thing is to, to know your acts and, and, and learn some music. The money will come. If you're serious and you get good, the, the money will come. But if you put that first, well, good luck with that. Wow. Well, those are some really amazing and thoughtful words to sort of wrap up this hour. And, Larry, we greatly appreciate you spending this time with us. It's really fantastic to, again, have you part of the Casio family. And and we love seeing the Casio boards every time you're out, you're out playing. It's uh it means a lot to, to every one of us here at Casio. And uh, and please do come back to New York. We miss you up here. Yeah. Yeah. We have, LDO wants to get there, so yeah. So we'll we'll talk about that as well. But, Maybe uh, not for another week or two or month. Uh, <laughs> but. Hey, hey, you know what? Hey, happy and blessed Passover to everybody. And and if you don't know about it, check it out because it's more serious than you think, and it's a blessing. And also Good Friday is coming up and Resurrection Day on Sunday. And like I said, everybody stop the nonsense with all the hate and all that nonsense. We need to be praying and and, and give God thanks and, and get this thing over with. And hopefully when we move on, people will have learned something. Unfortunately, there will always be people who didn't. And the closure is this one, one uh, video and it's, I had it posted and people are just like, oh my God, this guy spits on these oranges. Mm. And, the, and the store owner comes up and just smashes him. I thought he broke his neck. And the guy had that look like, what did I do? So, you know, there's there's a lot of psychopaths out there. But just stay prayed up. Be safe. God bless you and your families. And, and be ever wonderful. Uh -huh. All right. Well, thank you, Larry. So everybody, so uh, much. Larry's socials have been on the broadcast the whole time. Go check out LarryDunnMusic.com and at LarryDunnMusic on YouTube and Instagram. Give him a follow. And if you enjoyed this video here from Casio, uh, please give us a share, like, subscribe everywhere you can. So again, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Rich. And from Casio, we will see you soon on our next Artist Spotlight. My name is Mike Martin. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you soon. Bye-bye. 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 And we're out. That was awesome, Larry.